to some extent, we may be scapegoating the Saudis uh, for our own failures. In a few weeks before 9-11, the CIA, in late August 2001, finally went to the FBI and said, by the way, we have these two Al-Qaeda guys in the country. And um, really, you know, why didn't you tell us this? You know, we can't tell you why we didn't tell you, but uh, we, you know, and why did they finally tell the FBI? I think because they lost them. So the last time I was here, this place was full of Scientologists. So, um, I see we have a different audience tonight. Um, Fifteen years, I, I have to confess, I never thought that I'd still be writing about terrorism 15 years later. And this anniversary has caused me to reflect on um, some of the experiences that I've had that are chronicled in this book. You know, I, I started, my experience in writing about terrorism actually began before 9-11. I wrote a movie called The Siege uh, with Denzel Washington and uh, Annette Bening and uh, Tony Shalhoub and Bruce Willis. This, this came out in November 98. And if you remember, in August of 98, there were the bombings by al-Qaeda in East Africa, the American embassies. This was the very first assault on America. And uh, the movie was uh, about what would happen if terrorism came to America the way that it already had in London and Paris. What if it happened in New York? So that's what the movie was about. And even before 9-11, um, al-Qaeda was out there. And I, was, I had gone to New York and met people in the FBI who were involved in terrorism. Um, in August, that same month of the of the strikes uh, in against the American embassies, there were trailers for the movie in America in the theaters, and because of that, there was a bombing in Cape Town, South Africa, at Planet Hollywood, and the. Islamist bombers who claim credit said they'd done it because of the siege and they struck Planet Hollywood because Bruce Willis, one of the co-stars, was a partial owner of the Planet Hollywood. And you can imagine how this news affected me. I'd written a movie and people were dead. Two people died and a little girl lost her leg. Uh, so I was already aware of terror as a factor in life. Um, it's transformed our country in ways that I, in many ways, regret. Um, every community has been touched in one way or another. Your community certainly has been. Um, the last time I stayed in Cambridge, I stayed at the Charles Hotel where two of the 9-11 hijackers stayed. They also stayed in the Days Inn uh, over by Harvard uh, Stadium. Um, in this book, I chronicle the story of five Americans who were kidnapped in Syria. One of them is here tonight, thankfully. Theo Patnos, will you stand here? Theo was a young reporter who went to Syria and um, like several other American and American reporters and aid workers was captured. Unfortunately, of the five that I had the opportunity to write about, uh, Theo is the only survivor. Um, the real hero of that story is his mom, Nancy. Uh, right, Nancy, come on, stand up. <laughs> Nancy and, and other members of her family joined together to get Theo home. And uh, with uh, David Bradley, the publisher of The Atlantic, a very courageous individual, they found a way uh, to bring Theo home. I wish that they'd had more success. 
it made me think about the, on 9-11 when I talked to another survivor. Um, that day I was in Austin, Texas. And um, if you recall, uh, the planes were all shut down right after 9-11. Some of you I know are too young to recall that, but uh, all the planes were grounded for several days and, and uh, I couldn't get to New York. Um, I, I sent an email to my editor at the New Yorker saying, put me to work. And uh, later when the phones came back on in New York, uh, we had a conference call and there were New Yorker writers scattered all over the place, stuck you know, in the middle of their stories and their assignments all around the globe. And David uh, Remnick said, you know, just get stories for me and I will meld them together into a narrative. So I began trying to find a story and I, I located a, a young man named Kurt Yeltsin who was also a young reporter. Uh, he, um, he had been scheduled for an interview on Windows on the World, on the top of the World Trade Center, that morning at 9 o'clock. And he, for the first time in his life, slept through his subway stop. He frantically got on the next train and went back to the Chamber Street exit and got off and ran into the Trade Center. And uh, if you were never in the Trade Center, you know that you wouldn't know, but there was an escalator that led up to the elevator bank, 108 elevators. And uh, so he got up there, he got up to the elevator, and the, the elevator attendant was holding the door for this woman who was taking her own sweet time to get onto the elevator. And just as she stepped into the elevator, Kurt noticed she had a rose tattoo on her ankle, and the plane hit. And they didn't know. It was like the last moment of innocence. They didn't know at that moment what had happened. Was it an earthquake? Was it a bomb? What could it be? Uh, Kurt got off of the elevator and uh, a little bewildered, um, and he looked around in the lobby and he saw objects that seemed odd. Probably they were pieces of concrete or plaster, but you know something lying on the floor the size of a clock radio and something the size of an office desk. And he wandered through there and he saw the outdoors. He didn't realize he wasn't on the ground floor. This was like a terrace. So he walked out on the terrace and there were hundreds of shoes and what he thought were suitcases, but they were torsos. Those images, those transgressive images that we all saw on 9-11 traumatized this country and, and, and caused us to, and it was purposeful. Uh, it was purposeful on the part of Al-Qaeda to inflict a blow that was humiliating and would cause us to overreact and act against our own interests. In this book, I have a portrait of John O'Neill um, and Ayman al-Zawahri and Ali Sufan, who are all characters in, uh, in The Looming Tower, but these are the stories that are consolidated portraits of each of those men. Um, while I was traveling, I spent five years traveling and about half of that time I was away from home and I had to go to the Sudan and I was, because Bin Laden had been in Sudan for four years from 92 to 96 and I was desperate to find out any information about what he had done in those Sudan years and I'd been pressing my Sudanese intelligence contacts for any kind of information, any contacts they give me. So one day I get a knock on the door and there's this Sudanese intelligence guy with um, a, a man wearing, uh, he was a little pudgy and uh, he had on, uh, you know, those conical Indonesian hats that are a little flat top and, and he had a big laugh and uh, he came in and sat down. At the time, with all this travel, I had back problems. So I was, you know those balls you blow up to sit on for your back? So I was sitting on this and the Sudanese intelligence agent was really sleepy so he fell asleep on the bed. And I'm talking to um, this Al-Qaeda guy. And um, I said, who are you? And he said, you, you can call me Loe. 
Okay, and so I started quizzing him. He knew everything. It was one of the best sources I ever ran into, but I had no idea who he was. And so I came back to the United States and I started triangulating who could be this guy. And I finally found Mohammed Loy Bayazid, known in Al Qaeda as Abarida al Suri. He was the guy who took the notes when Al Qaeda was founded. He was Osama bin Laden's business manager. And he had told me all these stories about you know, the creation of Al Qaeda. So I flew back to Khartoum and he wouldn't see me. And that was upsetting. So I went back a third time and he finally agreed to see me and I said, well, Loy, it's a lot of trouble to come to Khartoum. Why didn't you see me last time? And he said, well, when we met the first time, I didn't know how seriously to take you because you were sitting on a balloon. <laughs> that was my initial meeting with Al Qaeda. Um, I spent a, a long time trying to get into Saudi Arabia. And one of my favorite sections of this book is it chronicles the story of the Saudis wouldn't let me in as a reporter. They were very, very sensitive. And uh, I finally got a job as an expat worker. Uh, I, I mentored these young reporters in Jeddah, which is Osama bin Laden's hometown. And it was chastening because normally as a reporter, you helicopter in, you stay in the Hilton, and you make telephone calls and set up appointments. Instead, I had a job. I had to go to work every day. I lived in a middle-class Saudi flat, and I had all these young Saudi reporters teaching me more about their culture than I could ever have learned as that reporter in the Hilton. Some of the things that I learned in Saudi Arabia deeply affected me. One was the level of depression was so staggering. One of my reporters did a story about a study of depression that was done at King Abdulaziz University, bin Laden's alma mater. And 60% of the students showed symptoms of depression. 7% of the girls had attempted suicide. This in a strict Saudi Muslim culture where suicide is absolutely taboo. I remember I was in a gym. Uh, all men uh, go to gym. Men, women are not allowed in the gym. But I was um, doing a headstand. And uh, the Saudi man came over and looked and said, would that be good for depression? So I, maybe. I, so I helped him up against the wall. Uh, I think another thing I learned in Saudi Arabia is the damage that gender apartheid has done uh, in widely in the Muslim world, but especially in Saudi Arabia, where it's so strictly enforced. One of my reporters, I had three women reporters, and I was not supposed to see them. And uh, they, they worked in an office underneath the stairs. And uh, I said, I can't mentor them if I can't see them. So... Uh, they made an exception and allowed once a week for this little train of women in black to come up to the newsroom conference room and I could, I could talk to them. And one of them was Najla. And um, a, a story about Najla, she had a real chip on her shoulder. She liked covering herself. She liked to be more conservative. Um, she used to, she wore the niqab um, but she used to have, uh, she used to even cover her eyes, but she kept tripping over her abaya, so she had to cut out little holes so that she could see. Uh, she wore gloves. She was extremely conservative. She had a, an interview one time in Riyadh, and so uh, she, the, she flew to Riyadh. The appointment was before the first flight from from Jeddah would arrive, so she had to fly in the night before. Now, as a Saudi woman, she couldn't travel without the permission of her nearest male relative. That would be her father, her husband, even her son, whoever is the man in charge of her. And so she got permission to travel, but as a single Saudi woman, she couldn't stay in a hotel So, by herself. So she got off the airplane, and she sat down 
And then it, the Riyadh airport closed around 11. And the guard came and said, you can't stay here. And she said, what are you going to do with me? This was Najla. What could he do with her? Uh, he let her sleep on the carpet of the mosque in the airport. And he closed, turned out the lights and locked up the airport. And the next morning they opened up the airport and Najla went to work. And that was what it was like for a Saudi woman. But it takes a toll on the, the men as well. Uh, one of the lessons I got from living in Saudi Arabia is that um, a large part of civilization is learning how to please girls. And this is something that these young men that I had been mentoring hadn't experienced. Uh, I went to the mall with one of my reporters and there, were a pair, there was a pair of Saudi women coming down the, the escalator. And they're so encased in black, sometimes you can't even tell what direction they're facing. And he looks up at them and without a trace of irony he says, check them out. <laughs> I was in uh, Saudi Arabia when um, in 2003 when we invaded Iraq and every Saudi I talked to was saying are you nuts of all places Iraq don't do this to yourself uh, but this is unfortunately characteristic of our country to wade into cultures we so poorly understand uh, with ideals that we'd like to inflict on a part of the world that is not responsive to them. Um, now, I was ambivalent about the invasion. It was an odd time. We were, my family was scattered all around. Um, my wife was in Austin. My son was in Chicago. My daughter was studying in Italy. They were all involved in demonstrations and parades against the war. And I was in Saudi Arabia, closer to the action, far more knowledgeable about it, but I, at that time, still believed that my government wouldn't lie to me uh, and would not present the case for weapons of mass destruction, which had been very persuasive to me. I thought Saddam Hussein is way too dangerous an individual to be in control of such weapons. So I was ambivalent. I did not like the idea of going to war in, Syria, in Iraq, but um, on the other hand, I thought it was a really, really dangerous moment. We didn't know at the time what was going on in the background. We didn't know, for instance, where that information about the weapons of mass destruction came from. It came from a man named Ibn Sheikh Al-Libi who was captured uh, in November 2001. Uh, he had been a trainer at a, at a jihadist camp. He was not formally affiliated with Al-Qaeda, but we thought he was. And um, so he was cooperative with the FBI, but the CIA took control of him. And at that time, we didn't do our own torturing. Um, we sent him to Egypt, whereas one CIA official said the nice thing about Egypt is you send them there in the morning and you get the answers in the afternoon. And we got the answers that afternoon that Saddam Hussein had weapons of mass destruction and he was working with Al-Qaeda. Those were exactly the answers that the Bush administration was looking for. And it was that testimony that found its way into Colin Powell's speech at the UN justifying that invasion. We didn't know at that time about Abu Ghraib. We didn't know about the waterboarding. But we soon would learn that America had, was becoming a different country. The jihad was also changing. Um, Al-Qaeda is funny to think about it being a relatively tame organization by comparison with ISIS. It's, ISIS is not really an evolution of Al-Qaeda. They're actually twins. Uh, they were born about the same time when I was working on the looming tower. Uh, I was curious about why there were so few people in Al-Qaeda from Jordan, Palestine, Lebanon, uh, Syria, the, the area of the world we call the Levant. Uh, there were some, but very few. 
And I discovered that there was another camp in Afghanistan where Al-Qaeda was born. It was run by a man named Abu Musab al-Zarqawi. He was not a member of Al-Qaeda at the time. Although bin Laden gave him money, he kept him at an arm's distance. They had two competitive organizations with two different dreams. Zarqawi wanted to create a caliphate right now. Bin Laden had a distant dream of a caliphate. And Zarqawi also wanted to create a civil war within Islam to eliminate the Shiites. That seemed wildly impractical to Bin Laden. It was in the 2003 invasion that allowed, that created the chaos that allowed Zarqawi, who relocated there, to create the precursor organization that became the Islamic State and to grow into the, using the philosophy uh, of the management of savageries. And or, a, the idea is that you create as much barbaric behavior as you can, scaring people to come under your umbrella. It's the same philosophy that the mob has. So I would just want to end with the idea that terrorism does come to an end eventually. Um, there's a study by Audrey Kurth Cronin that I quote in the epilogue of this book. She studied more than 400 different terrorist organizations. The average life of a terrorist organization, she found, is eight years. Well, Al-Qaeda just celebrated its 28th birthday. So it's a lot older than most terror organizations should be. Um, religious terrorist organizations tend to have a longer life than other kinds. One group called the Hindu thugs lasted for 600 years. So I don't think that that's what we're facing. Most terror groups fail. Um, terror is normally uh, something that people don't respond to, people are repelled by, their goals are unrealistic, and eventually they tend to fail. Some terror organizations come to an end when you decapitate the head. That worked really well with, for instance, Aum Shinrikyo, the Japanese uh, cult that had it played out, I think it could have been more dangerous than Al-Qaeda. Um, it's an interesting lesson that the genie of terror doesn't, just doesn't belong alone to Islam. This was a, a blind Japanese yoga instructor. Um, but by arresting him, essentially it, it, it eliminated that organization as a threat. Same with uh, Shining Path in Peru. It didn't work with Al-Qaeda. We killed bin Laden, and it's not extinct. In fact, there are more people in radical Qaeda-like movements today than there ever have been. It didn't work with ISIS. We killed Zarqawi, and uh, the organization has in many ways only grown stronger. Uh, some organizations evolve. They become political parties, or they, more commonly, they become criminal organizations. Um, that's a possibility that, uh, that Al-Qaeda was simply turned like the Colombian organization FARC in, more into a criminal organization, the Taliban with the opium, that, that is a possible outcome for them. But I don't think so. Um, some organizations, you negotiate, like the IRA, it took 25 years for Great Britain and IRA to come to terms on, great, on the Good Friday Agreement, but it seems to be a great success. That's not a chance that that would happen with, with radical Islamist movements. And then there's repression. Um, it's difficult for democracies to be as ruthless as, for instance, Russia was with Chechnya. So I don't think that's a possibility for the United States. Uh, there's also the possibility that some terror organizations succeed. It's a myth that terror organizations always fail. The, uh, the best example is Irgun, the Israeli terrorist organization that was led by Menachem Begin so brilliantly. Um, 
that uh, when American forces went into Kandahar and they went into bin Laden's compound, they found a copy of Begin's memoir in bin Laden's library, perhaps because he was studying how a terrorist leader went on to eventually win the Nobel Prize for Peace. Uh, Begin was also a model for Nelson Mandela. Uh, so those are the possible outcomes. In my opinion, the only possible outcome for Al-Qaeda is failure. And, and I also think it's going to take a while. Um, Al-Qaeda and ISIS are constantly under pressure. Um, Al ISIS is not really an army, it's a horde. And it, you know, when armies are arrayed against it, they just simply disappear and flee. But they are an amorphous organization that um, will spread around and, and, and metastasize uh, as long as there are any people left in that organization. And they also have a virtual component that will keep it alive for some time. I think that Al Qaeda is rejuvenating itself, unfortunately. Uh, its affiliates in Yemen and Saudi Arabia, even in Pakistan and India and, and in North Africa, are, are not diminishing. So these are, these are problems that we're going to be facing uh, for quite a long time. I'm going to, just to finish this thought about America um, and what kind of country we've become. Um, in the book, I, I mentioned that I had a date in 1965. One, the only date I had in 1965, but it was a, the most memorable one. Um, I was in high school, and I, I couldn't afford to take my girlfriend out, so we went to the airport in Dallas. It's called Love Field. And back then, we walked through the airport and went out on the tarmac, climbed into one of these international jetliners that we thought had just come from Paris. And we sat in the first class seats. And um, the stewardesses, as we called them then, they brought us a snack. And we sat there and entertained ourselves as the cosmopolitan people that we were. And then we went up in the FAA tower. Hi, kids, come on in. You know, so we sat there and we watched them landing the planes. Well, that America is long gone. And, um, but I, I hope it won't be forgotten. The, that was a you know, community built on trust and safety. Um, even though we were in the middle of Vietnam, we were in a war, uh, I would like for people to remember there was a time when we didn't walk into an office building and have our picture made, when you didn't go visit the Liberty Bell in Philadelphia, for instance, and have to take off your belt and your shoes. These are small liberties, but they are liberties, and we're talking about fighting for our liberties. Uh, the, we've compromised ourselves in so many different ways, and I don't, I, don't, uh, I don't argue that some of these things were very necessary, but if they're forgotten, if we forget the kind of country that we were and the people that we were, then I think terrorism really will have won. Well, I'd be happy to entertain any of your questions. I open it up to questions. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you for your talk. I'm curious, uh, in all of your reporting and traveling about uh, thinking about terrorism and these issues, has it changed how you think about human nature or the human condition or what it is to be a, to be a person? How has, it, how has it shaped your attitude about that? Did everybody hear that? Um, it's an interesting, very personal question. Um, you know, when you're a reporter, uh, your job is to go out and mix into other people's lives. And it, I've seen so many tragedies. And, you know, talk to so it does, you do have to carry those things. But that's your job, is to go out and, 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 and 
try to find out what is happening to these people and, uh, and convey to your readers uh, what's going on in the world. I always find that the, the best means of doing that is through finding human stories. Uh, I've, I've called these people donkeys. I know this sounds like a disparaging term, but I like to find a person like John O'Neill, for instance, um, who, um, whose life, you know, it, who can take the reader into a world, carry the reader on his back into a world that he hasn't been exposed to, like the world of counterterrorism, and, and can carry a lot of information on his back. And my feeling is that once the reader gets um, involved with that character, then all the information that I have to put on to the reader's mind is greedily received because it pertains to a person that they care about. I, as a writer, care about those people too. And often I, I get very emotional sometimes when I'm writing. Um, it's, especially when I was writing the ISIS story, that was, that was really, really difficult for me. Uh, and I'm constantly exploring why people would go into the, such movements and why they would behave like that. I'm not any different from other terrorism experts. We never have figured out a single thing that causes people to radicalize. You can make the list. You know, there's poverty. There's lack of opportunity. There's no employment. There's gender apartheid. There's tyranny. Uh, there's injustice. There's colonialism. You, uh, there's a long, long list of reasons that we might justify or prod people into joining such movements. Not a single one of them by itself has been shown to be a real cause of creating terrorists. They're too diverse for us, and we don't understand what's going on. Um, in the beginning, Al-Qaeda was a kind of a professional organization. Bin Laden was a businessman, Zawahri a, a medical doctor, a lot of engineers. There was a theory going around for a while that uh, terrorists were uh, maybe had Asperger's uh, syndrome because there's so many engineers and we think engineers are so strange they must have Asperger's. Um, but you know, uh, all over time the movement has changed. Different kinds of people, more proletarian maybe, have come into it. We don't know what draws people in there. But my theory is all of those causes that I enumerated, I just think of them as tributaries in a river of despair that runs through the Arab world and, and the Muslim world. And it is, if you are a, a young Muslim um, in that part of the world, your opportunities to express yourself are so diminished. And, um, and suppose you are a young Muslim in France. Uh, about 10% of the population of France is Muslim, according to the State Department. As many as 70% of the prisoners are. What a stark measure of alienation in, in that society. I think you know, there's a profound uh, question of identity because those young people don't feel French and the French don't feel like they're French either. So who are they? Well, if you put yourself in that spot, I think the answer you might come up with is, I am a Muslim, and that's who I am. Uh, when we get to the day when someone asks one of those people, who are you, and, you say, and they say, I'm a French Muslim, then we may have made a lot of progress. Yes, sir. Could you comment on the ongoing uh, Washington dispute about the ability to sue Saudi Arabia for responsibility for 9 11? Is that, is that a good idea? Would that lead to anything? What is your sense of Saudi's responsibility? For the question is uh, about this possible, you know, that Congress had just passed a, a bill um, that, been, that Obama promises to veto um, that would allow. 9/11 uh, victims to sue Saudi Arabia, the government of 
of Saudi Arabia. And this brings up um, the question of sovereign immunity, uh, which is, you know, nations don't sue each other. Um, and uh, should there be an exception for Saudi Arabia? Um, and my feeling is, I don't think that the government of Saudi Arabia is to blame. I think there are a lot of Saudis who have been involved in funding, uh, and there are Saudi organizations, such as their religious establishment, which have been spreading uh, propaganda around the world. Um, but have has the Saudi government been expressly funding terror? I don't know. Um, I am, as a reporter and an American citizen, very concerned about the fact that we don't know a lot of the things that happened leading up to 9-11. And in particular for me, I thought by now we'd know the answer that I, to the question that I posed in the Looming Tower. Uh, two hijackers came to America in January of 2000, 20 months before 9-11. And in March, the CIA found out they were here. They were living in San Diego. And uh, they had contacts with people in the Saudi consulate there. The FBI, since they didn't know about it at the time, they, they, they couldn't do anything about it. But in retrospect, a lot of the FBI agents I've talked to feel like the deal was that the CIA is not allowed by law to operate in this country, nor the Saudis for that matter. But these were Saudi citizens, and so the, there may have been a deal struck where the Saudis would monitor them. And uh, the CIA had been unable to penetrate Al-Qaeda, even though young men from all over the world were walking into the camps. Uh, the CIA was unable to, to develop any Al-Qaeda contacts. So, I'd like to know more about that. And I think that, you know, to some extent we may be scapegoating the Saudis uh, for our own failures. In a few weeks before 9-11, the CIA in late August 2001 finally went to the FBI and said, by the way, we have these two Al-Qaeda guys in the country. And um, really, you know, why didn't you tell us this? You know, we can't tell you why we didn't tell you, but uh, we, you know, and why did they finally tell the FBI? I think because they lost them. They lost them. And who do you go to when you lose to Al Qaeda guys in America? Well, there's only really one organization, so they went to, and it was too late. They didn't find them. But um, if we're going to start pointing blame, I, the first place I would turn right now is to ask the CIA to come clean about that operation. I, it just is not plausible to me. According to the Inspector General of the CIA, their own Inspector General, 50 to 60 people inside the CIA read the memo about the, uh, the presence of Al-Qaeda Al-Qaeda, they weren't known to be hijackers, but Al-Qaeda members in San Diego at that time. 50 to 60 people read the memo. That's just the people that actually saw the physical thing. How, you know, it must have spread through the whole building. So let's just say the entire upper hierarchy of the CIA knew that Al-Qaeda was in America at the same time that George Tenet said his hair was on fire and he was running around declaring war on Al-Qaeda, but he couldn't tell the FBI. Uh, that Al-Qaeda was already in America. Uh, and that's where I put my efforts. Yes, ma'am, right here. Um, regarding the United States and terrorism, terrorist groups, ISIS, Al-Qaeda, what do you foresee if Trump is elected and what do you foresee if Clinton is elected? <laughs> oh, boy. Uh, <laughs> I... It's obvious that, that Al-Qaeda, you know, like just the way that Al-Qaeda, uh, when, when, um, when George Bush was running for re-election and, uh, 
and bin Laden came out and made a statement, you know, threatening Americans. And I called uh, his brother-in-law, who is a great source for me, and uh, it was he was bin Laden's best friend at one time, and he became one of my friends. Uh, it was a weird uh, connection to bin Laden, you know. Uh, I said, Jamal, what what do you make of bin Laden's statement? He said, I think Obama just, I think Osama just voted for Bush. Uh, I think ISIS is doing what it can to make sure that Trump gets elected. It would be um, the go- you know, just keep in mind the basics of terrorism. Terrorism. The goal of terrorism is to create repression inside the governments that they're attacking and uh, cause the people to turn against their own government and create repression and and naturally repression goes hand in hand with tyranny. Well, if that's their playbook, it does look familiar, doesn't it? And so I worry about that. Uh, I think we should keep in mind that we're not, we don't face an existential threat from Al-Qaeda or ISIS. Uh, When bin Laden attacked America, he had this idea that America would have the same fate as the Soviet Union, which, you know, when it went into Afghanistan uh, and then left with its tail between its legs, it broke apart. It just, you know, Soviet Union, the mighty Soviet Union dissolved. And so he thought if he could just attack America, prod them to come into Afghanistan, the same thing would happen to America. America would no longer be the United States, it would be the disunited States. And Islam would regain its rightful place as the premier power in the world. Well, he was totally wrong. That's, he can't do that to us. Only we can do that to ourselves. And when we make a mistake, it's a colossal mistake. Uh, just setting aside the, the bloodletting in Iraq, the, the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, 15 years longer than World War II and Vietnam put together, the longest wars we've ever fought, depending on the counting, between four to six trillion dollars spent. Um, Even Bernie Sanders couldn't have spent all that money. Uh, Did we invest it in, in making the world a better place? No, we invested all that money in making the world more miserable in creating chaos, in breaking governments apart, in creating refugees, in allowing um, uh, allowing ISIS and other terrorist organizations to flourish. That's the result of our investment. No one's been held accountable for that either. And, and that there are people who are responsible for it. It was one of the greatest errors in our nation's history. And... Um, And I hope we're not on the verge of making a a similar error in this election. Yes, ma'am. Speak a little louder. Do you see the political correctness um, that basically makes it impossible for people in the general population to to speak against things like radicalizations and Islamophobia? I mean, it made me think of the Second World War. They would have been shouting, Nazi phobia. Mm-hmm. They would talk against the Nazis. Um, what's, what do you, do you feel that this is a, a self-defeating process? Because it seems so widespread. And it's not just in this country. Uh, the question has to do with political correctness and, and, and Islamophobia. And I think... Uh, what would help America's attitude about Islam is to recognize who the Muslims are in America. Um, now, I just told you about France. I'm not. I'm setting that aside. I think Europe is in peril, and I think you know that it's it's a uh, it's going to be a long term problem for Europe. The Muslim community in America, uh, the average Muslim is better educated than the average American, makes about the same amount of money as the average American, is less likely to go to prison than the average American. They're a very successful immigrant community and have been very helpful in this. And look at all the 
people that have gone into ISIS and Al Qaeda from European and Russian uh, sources, comparatively very few Americans. So, you know, they're, they're overall a great asset and boon to our country. Uh, but I think that gets lost in the in the overarching idea that Muslims in general hate America and that they are attacking America. Um, that's my experience with Muslims in this country. Yes, ma'am. Time for one or two short questions. All right, short one. I was wondering if you see any rays of light to be hope for America to become a better country in the face of terrorism. Is there anything that that we can do to make ourselves more hopeful and do more good in the world? So can we become a better country in the face of all this? And I think it's useful to remember when our founders created those liberties that we fight so hard for, they were being attacked by the only superpower in the world, Great Britain. And yet they came up with all these liberties of freedom of press, freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, all of those things, the right to be left alone in your house and so on. Many of these things have been impinged since the war on terror. So we should remember where we came from. And the other thing, I think we, you know, we have to accommodate ourselves to the fact that we will be attacked. Um, and uh, we have to accept that our intelligence agencies aren't always going to protect us. Um, so that that's going to be a part of our lives for a while. But the lesson I would like for us to learn is that we have to be a lot more cautious about wading into regions of the world that we poorly understand where we have very low possibility of changing their behavior. Now this can come at some human cost. Um, I look back at when Theo was in captivity. Uh, you know, these other Americans were uh, still alive and uh, the uh, Yazidi people were being slaughtered by ISIS. They were being chased up onto this mountain uh, and, and they were going to be slaughtered. And by uh, ISIS had said that they were going to do this. And so in a humanitarian moment, uh, President Obama ordered American bombers to stop that and they did. And we saved the Yazidi people. But immediately after that, uh, Jim Foley was the first to die. Uh, Jihadi John appears after a montage of American bombers uh, striking Syria. So I would not have wanted to make that decision that President Obama had to make. He saved thousands of lives. He lost four American lives. Syria is uh, a Bashar al-Assad is a kind of Stalin in the modern day. He's a mass murderer. And yet Syria, the government of Syria, poses no threat to America. ISIS does. Uh, I think we have to weigh very carefully our national interest when we get involved in uh, enterprises where lives, our, our own lives are going to be at risk and where our commitments may be more entangled than we would like for them to be. I think if we can accept those things, be more modest about our role in the world, and just to, on the moment of hope though, just I, I can't prove this, but I think that you know America always talks about its power in the world. I think the power of our example is the greatest power we have. And in 2008, I made a speech at uh, Cairo University where Obama, after he got elected, would make his big speech, his outreach to the Muslim world. And at the time, the primaries were going on. And so, you know, this was the audience. Um, there were all these uh, young uh, Egyptian girls in hijab and, and um, uh, and then uh, the guys uh, scattered around in the audience and I asked if you were an American voter how many here would vote for Hillary Clinton and all the girls in hijab you know raised their hand they were following this great interest and how many for Obama you know 
How many for John McCain? One guy from the embassy. <laughs> so, but those were the same kids that were in Tahrir Square a few months later. They saw radical social change take place nonviolently. And I think that example was riveting to the Arab world. And it gave birth to the Arab Spring. And I think one day that Arab Spring will return. And that's the real hope that they, in emulating our example, will find a way out of the terrorism and tyranny that now besets the Arab world. Well, thank you so much. And what does she do by herself in the van? She picks up a machine gun and fires it wildly out the door, out the window, and tries to free Bill Harris. Considering further, she empties one magazine and gets another gun and shoots up the, the window further, miraculously not hitting anyone, but successfully freeing B and Bill and Emily Harris. And the three of them then take off in the van, separated from the other six, going to where Emily Harris had a summer job fairly recently, Disneyland, where they register at a hotel in a motel room.